Eric Yu asks, Internet celebrity, where do you live? Very good question. Mm, so simple, you think you think can fool me with that? That's a, such a simple question, let me tell you. Alright, my address is 982, that's right, Upper Changi Road North, postal code Singapore, 507709. Please send all your questions and inquiries to this address. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, enough stalling. Welcome to this video, I guess. It's the Q&A video. Uh, I've been putting this off for a while because I've been having quite a lot of stuff in ARMY. I need to stay back a lot of weekends recently, so I haven't had much time to go and edit stuff like this, and especially recording. But anyway, thank you all for 2,000 subscribers, holy sh**, man. It's been a ride. I can't- I couldn't even bring myself to expect this, like, just even just two years back. Like, when I hit a thousand subscribers, I really thought <laughs> that was it. I was looking at Social Blade and seeing the future predictions for subscriber milestones and they were all so far in the future. I, I really didn't think that this channel would get double the size in just two years. So yeah, thank you so much everyone for all the support you've given me in the comments. Uh, and the views or likes, your playlist views, I don't know what matters anymore in the algorithm, but yeah, this this video is for you guys. And also for me to get my lazy ass up of my f***ing bed, uh. Also, if you couldn't already tell, this video is gonna contain an infinite, uncountable number of cuts because I cannot talk for sh I am really sorry if this puts you off in any way, though I think getting the answer that I want to give across is better than trying to get everything on the first take. So please bear with me while you hear a jump cut every two seconds. Alright, on to the questions. Okay, first question. We'll continue on with Eric Yu from just now. Is it Eric Yu? I, I think that's a Chinese last name. Anyway, Eric Yu or Yu asks, Are you planning on any other large-scale projects after your Explorers arrangement, such as a rearrangement of Gates, SPMD, or another game like Omori? For one thing, I'm not a very big fan of Gates or Super Pierce 3 Dungeon, because I've never played those two games before. Yeah, I, I probably would try to do some sort of rearrangement project for some of the tracks. Uh, not all of them, like I'm currently doing Flex Forest because I like to do arrangements of music from games that I have actually played fully and have an idea of what the connotation of each track is so that I can have a better understanding of how I should approach arranging such a track or like what ideas I can put into a track like that. You know, it's more authentic that way, I guess. To answer your question, yes, but not as big as what I'm doing right now. As for another game like Omori, a funny thing about Omori, I have it downloaded, it's on my desktop. I played past probably the first hour of the game and it looks huge. There's, I think, about 150 or more tracks in the OST and I barely even scratch the surface. It, it is quite a good game from what I've played so far, and some of the tracks are quite banging, so maybe, maybe I might do an Omori project. A lot of people are doing Omori covers. I've seen one guy upload a bunch of Omori Chat Dune tracks to their channel. They're really good. Go check them out. I'm gonna put a link in the description. Uh, I can't remember what the guy's name is, so I'll edit him into the video. Like now. Okay, there is a surprisingly large number of musicians who have arranged the entire soundtrack of Explorers. You, Anoith slash Cytolis, Paco, Beastman Ben, TGH, to name a few. Neglecting the emotional impact that Explorers had on its player base, is there anything in the soundtrack slash Arati Yoshi style that lends itself to be rearranged so much? I, I've answered this question I think about three times and I never really got an answer that I was satisfied with, so uh, I'm just gonna compile whatever I said beforehand. First off, I think that 
the structure of the Explorers and Mystery Dungeon soundtracks as a whole is going to be simple inherently because of course they're meant to be looping tracks that are, it's just supposed to be background music for the game that's actually happening. So it's not going to be very complex, yet it's going to have to be very striking. It's going to be solid, yet very simplistic. And I think that's quite a perfect storm for rearrangements, I guess, because having such a simplistic uh, structure means that you can expand upon the originals a lot. Like for example, a dungeon track will only really contain two main ideas, maybe? That, that minute will just loop forever and ever. So for arrangements like mine, where the majority of it is just expanding on the original, there's quite a lot of creative freedom to be had there, and I guess that fuels arrangements like mine. But of course, the examples you gave, they are more so arranging in a remastering style, where they remain very faithful to the originals. And I guess contributing to that is the fact that being on ADS, the quality of the sound back then wasn't very good, as in there were full-on VST exported MP3 files, it was all MIDI and sound fonts. So there's of course a lot of people who will take the opportunity to do exactly that and make a full-on VST remastering of the original soundtrack. That seems to be very common along most other games from this era, especially Pokemon. But of course, yeah, I, I can't neglect the emotional impact that Explorer had on its player base. That's the main reason, I think. Uh, I feel like a lot of people are going on the bang wagon, just like me, honestly. <laughs> I was mainly inspired to do this sort of rearrangement project because I know so many others who have done it before me, and I'm pretty sure most others are like that as well. Oh, and by the way, if you somehow stumbled across my channel before finding any of these people that you've mentioned, uh. Go and follow them, they're really good. They release really good things. Okay, next question. Not sure how many people would be interested, but have you considered live streaming slash recording your arrangement process a la Darren Ang's Sky Tower? Mm. If you're not sure what he's talking about here, uh, Darren Ang is another YouTuber who happens to also be from Singapore and does music. He's been inactive for a while because he's doing university right now. God, that's gonna be me in two years. Anyway, he's cool. I collaborated with him once, about five years ago. I also edited a few videos for him on his channel. Regarding this arrangement process sort of video, I don't think it's a good idea for me to make these because for one, I'm not, again, I'm not used to talking to a microphone or rather even just narrating over anything at all. So <laughs> I think this sort of having a video where it's just all improv, all on the go, talking is just not a good idea. I'm not sure if such a video would even be very entertaining in terms of that, but if there's enough demand for it, I might do it. Other people have asked me for this on Twitter. I got one person asking whether I could do sort of content like this, but uh, I replied to that with a another answer, which is that my arrangement methodology is kind of non-existent. I don't have a flow to how I go about arranging. It's just, it's, it's not a very step-by-step -step process that I could kind of narrate or describe very well through a video. Though I guess it'd be interesting to find out what like I do differently from other people, I guess, by making these videos. Yeah, so in the end, I, I think I will consider doing one of these eventually, especially because I've already gotten past the first bear, which is getting enough courage to actually record myself with a microphone. Uh, so maybe in future? Not in the near future, but I will do it eventually. I will, I will. Okay, next question. What's your major slash field of study? <laughs> this is a bit of a tricky question for me to answer because I am not a university student yet, so I don't have any majors but I will answer this based on my current education level. In Singapore, we have this education system that's similar to the UK. So we go to primary school, then secondary school. And before university, you go to something called pre-university education. And in that category, there's something called a junior college. And I went to a junior college and there I took a subject combination of biology, chemistry, maths, and economics. And 
the economics is, is something like a minor because it's something called an H1 subject which is less advanced than what we call an H2 subject which is the other three subjects. Yeah, so basically I'm taking something that's called a uh, science combination as opposed to a arts or humans combination which would include more uh, humanity subjects such as literature, knowledge and inquiry if you know what that is, and things like art and music. Which is funny because hey I'm doing music but I'm taking a science focused uh, subject combination. In the future when I go to university I have a placing in a life sciences course so I'm going to be majoring in that. Uh, I'm not sure how this is going to transition to my work life because I'm planning to become a researcher though it's definitely very hard to progress in that profession and also to choose exactly what you want to specialize in so for now it's still up to still up to me I guess uh, adulthood next question do you have any Utao artist recommendations outside of Gyozu and Speeder 2 been listening to recommendations on down and off trodden path and decided that I'm not far enough down the rabbit hole would also appreciate the playlist so while I'm in the process of editing and recording this, I am compiling a little playlist of Udao and other K-adjacent songs and music. You can find a link to it in the description, or maybe there's a card here if I remember to put it in. I'm not a big fan of vocals, so that, that playlist is mostly just going to be instrumental stuff. And of course you have the original K-san tracks in there as well. Basically I just compiled every single Utao and instrumental K-san adjacent thing into that playlist from my favorites playlist and my like videos. So I hope you can find some new things in there, though it's highly unlikely considering that our interest seems to be very very similar. Uh, but I can give you a few suggestions. Uh, I'm not going to name any of them like through, through, through voice because there's just too many of them and I don't know how to pronounce half of them, I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, you can look at a few of these. I think there are going to be some obscure ones that you might not know. If you're looking for videos that sound like Keisan, uh, there's an actual name for it in the Japanese community and it's called, uh, in English it translates roughly to neighborhood song, but in Japanese it's called uh, Kaiwai Kyoku. I, I have no idea if I pronounced that good. Uh, but if you search down YouTube, you can find a bunch of other playlists that people have compiled over the years. Uh, you can also try searching down Nico Nico, but I don't really use Nico Nico to be honest. So maybe you'll have some luck there. Final question from Eric. How long have you been arranging or writing music? Was there any specific transition between arranging and writing original music? Or have you always sought and practiced? both. Let's see, how long have I been arranging slash writing music? Like legitimately on my computer, probably secondary school when I first started secondary school because I joined my school's concert band at the time and that was the sort of catalyst for this whole channel and my entire hobby. And that would be probably about uh, what, seven years now. It's quite a while, honestly, my god. Uh, was there any specific transition? Okay, that probably was. I can't really pinpoint it, but definitely at first I was doing just arranging. If you look back at my channel, you will see my cringy ass Undertale phase. Uh, that was also coinciding with where I started doing music. So that was where I got my starting arranging. My first arrangement, in fact, the first thing I've ever written with MuseScore was uh, a really shitty arrangement of Save the World from Undertale. I think I still have a file, I might just play it right now. Writing original music, I think I always have some ideas for original music back in the day when I was arranging, but I never really put them down to paper, I kind of had them in my, in my mind. <laughs> Maybe I jotted it down like a few scribbles somewhere on MuseScore, but I never finished them. My first ever original, full on original, completed piece was Forward. Uh, you can see it on my channel somewhere. 
there was actually one more original piece that I worked on for a while before that, but it never got finished. It was very close to being finished. I, it was the, the the sheet music was finished. I just didn't like how it sounded, so I never released it. Maybe a future video? Hmm, who knows. Anyway, I think there is a similarity between most people when you're talking about arranging and writing. You probably arrange first because I feel like most people, when they get into music, it's because they are a fan of other people's music and they want to play those people's music. So what other way is there to play others' music than to just arrange it yourself, right? So. I'd say that's probably a common thing among most composers out there. And furthermore, composing is really just stealing ideas from other people who you like and just picking them and putting them in different orders and seeing which one sticks. Aside from questions, I'd like to thank you for all the amazing work that you've done over the years. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that you've single-handedly defined my musical tastes and reunited my love for piano with your arrangements, recommendations, and viewer interaction. Please never stop writing music. My god. Oh. <clears throat> F ah, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate that. You've taken the time to comment this paragraphs long comment. I'm really grateful that I have fans out there who are so devoted to me <laughs> that their entire influence is just my stuff. So thank you so so much for your questions and I hope I did a good job answering them. Alright, wow that was a really big question to start with but now we're getting on with some shorter comments. Not to be mean or anything. I'm honestly fine with giant comments like that. Okay, next question. What country do you live in and what state, province, or region? Mm, I mean, okay, I can answer the first question. I live in Singapore. Uh, what state, province, or region? Uh, I, mm, I don't live in the US. Um, <laughs> how do I answer this question? I, I, do not, I do not have any of those. What are those things? What is the US? Right, Guy Ja asks, uh, what your name and how do I know Kaysan's songs and others? And thank you for making great piano arrangements. Ah, uh, no problem man. I have revealed this on the internet before, though you probably had to dig a bit for it. Uh, my name is Dylan, spelt like the Nintendo character that no one remembers. Uh, other than it being in Smash and being the greatest assist trophy of all time. Don't judge, don't, don't, don't DM me, don't at me. I think we all got introduced to Kaysan through the same means and that's by the thing called the YouTube algorithm. Uh, it basically just popped up in every single person's for you page for some reason. It's, it's kind of miraculous actually. Someone who didn't want any attention at all just got lucky and got all the attention in the world and he kinda disappeared. So, hmm, don't know, don't know how things work on this earth. Next question comes from Kikashit54. Is piano your primary instrument and how did I get started? Okay, I kind of answered that second part of it just now, uh, but piano isn't my primary instrument. Uh, when I joined concert band, I played horn, uh, French horn, for about six years or so. So that is my primary instrument. Uh, I cannot play piano. I, I suck at it. I mean, I can play like two songs on it. Uh, they're not very good. But hey, if I ever get enough money to buy a French horn, I will do it immediately. But unfortunately, that is an investment I cannot make at this current juncture. Alright, this next question comes from Mr. M Music. Uh, first question, where did the name 59 Squared originate from? Okay, if you've been following this channel since I posted cringy Minecraft videos, then you know that I had the original username Robang592, it's pronounced Robang by the way, and funny thing about that name, it, I, I came up with it when I was 10, so the reasoning behind it is gonna be so cringy, but I'm just gonna say it anyway. If you are not familiar, I do love birds, so 
at the time, one of my favorite birds was the robin. And of course, what else could you do to symbolize your love for robins in your username than by just lifting the first syllable of that word? Alright, so that's where Rob came from. Then where did the ang part of it come from? Oh, of course, I'm damn random. Let's, let's think about some random things. Explosions, alright. Perfect. Bang. Raw bang. Perfect portmanteau. Anyway, uh... Okay, <laughs> the, the three numbers at the back. That's the important part. Uh, wh what do they mean? You think I had a good answer, but actually I don't even know where, I, where the f*** those numbers came from. I'm pretty sure I like number five. I like, it was my favorite number. Mostly because I think the times table for it was just the best to remember. I don't know why I didn't like ten. Five is the best number, apparently, to my 10-year-old self. Uh, 9 and 2. Who knows where they came from? I just picked them on my keyboard, I guess. So, now we know where Rabang 592 came from. Uh, the transition to 59 squared. How did that happen? Uh, I decided that I didn't want to associate myself with the name Rabang after I stopped making content mainly as a Minecraft creator. So I decided just to rename myself to just the numbers. So I couldn't just name myself 592, right? That would be just weird. So you have to do some spicing up in here. So I lifted the two up a bit. The game is square. That's where the username came from. I mean, I guess no one really has good explanations to how they get their usernames either. So maybe I shouldn't feel so bad for how nonsensical my reasoning for this is. But I do. I feel really, really cringe right now. Alright, second part to this question. Uh, how is the military going? Uh, I'd like to answer this alongside another question I had, which was, uh, How have you been doing lately? by Jenna Friedman. Yeah, the army is honestly a lot less worse than I expected when I first go in, but hey, I am very cynical, so I expect the worst when... I really don't need to. So regarding how the military is going, as you can see this video is extremely delayed. So I've recorded an answer for this like a few months back, but now I'm gonna answer differently because well currently I'm doing a few different commitments in the army. A few are quite big and I won't go into detail into what they are because you know confidentiality and stuff, but before this it was actually not that bad so i was able to upload a lot more than i expected i was going to be when i first joined because again yeah i i am extremely cynical and being on an island so far away from everyone else i was thinking of course i'm not gonna have enough time to do anything but when i think about it it's kind of like going to school and in fact, when I was still studying, most of my music and YouTube channel work was done during weekends anyway. So, in reality, the time I had to work on side hobbies and stuff hasn't really changed that much. Uh, but now, it seems like most of my weekends are actually kind of getting cut off because of said commitments. So, it's actually a little bit more hard for me to work right now on this channel. But overall, the military really, I, I think it, it's definitely changed me in a few different ways. Don't know for the better or for the worse, but it's made me think differently. I, I, I'd like to say I'm more outspoken. I really not though. Thanks for the questions, you two. Okay, next question from Spartan Chief 17 uh, you've subscribed for a very long time. I recognize your username. Anyway, what first got you into reorchestrating music in the first place? I did answer this question just now, but maybe I'll go more into depth. So, the first few arrangements I did were just simple piano arrangements, mostly because I did not know how to arrange for a full orchestra. Uh, I did try to do full orchestra arrangements, then I realized it was too much work for just one person who is just doing this as a hobby. And, but that was back when I was doing like crappy Undertale arrangements. Uh, so maybe now I'm actually more up to doing entire orchestras. Anyway, side tangent. I transitioned into making 
orchestra slash band slash multi-instrument covers of arrangements starting around I'd say 17 or 2016. And I think that was because I was getting more confident about my own arranging ability. Although how cliche this may sound, it really just comes from a genuine love for music as a whole. I think that I decided at some point that I, I like music a lot. So contributing my own work to the scene would be something that I hope to do, you know? Okay, so how does working on the Explorers reorchestration differ from the Rescue Team project? While the Rescue Team project was more of an excuse to just arrange all the music in the Rescue Team, but you, you can tell when you look at the Explorers reorchestration and the Rescue Team orchestration, the Explorers reorchestration focuses more on the individual tracks as standalone things while the Rescue Team project was meant more as a medley. Though the aim of both projects was honestly the same, it was just to act as a scapegoat to have me arrange every single track in the soundtrack of both games. While the Rescue Team project, because it was a standalone project by itself, it had to have only one ensemble of instruments playing. So that was actually a little bit of an obstacle that I had to work with because for the entire one plus hour of music I had to write it was all just horn, timpani and drum set not to mention that I had no idea how to write for timpani so the entire part is impossible to play <laughs> if you hadn't noticed yet honestly the horn parts are also kind of impossible to play so yeah, you can see that the Rescue Team project really wasn't... It, it grew to something a lot bigger than what I had in mind at the start. Because y you can see that the original first movement was only 3 minutes or was 4 minutes long. And the, the, the length just kept growing as I was like thinking, Oh, I should arrange this track as well. You know, maybe maybe I should just arrange all the tracks. So when I started the Explorers reorchestration, I decided that I should not restrict myself to have the entire soundtrack be arranged as one piece of sheet music. So I went ahead and made covers of each track like a normal person would. What kind of quirks and interesting tidbits have you discovered within the music while working on it that you would not have noticed otherwise? It, it's hard to point out specific things because it, it's I am arranging these pieces spread out across a few years at this point so the the novelty of each piece has kind of worn out on me admittedly and you know what it's natural because of course i've been doing this for so long it's almost like i consider it to be work rather than a hobby i guess one notable thing about the soundtrack is the percussion especially the drum set parts of certain tracks i i found i found that it's actually quite complex and not at all like a generic 4-4 four, four beat for instance. Uh, I remember in Sky Tower, the hi-hat part for it is actually really intricate. It, it, it interplays along with the background triangle and the shaker I think. I can't remember what the exact instrumentation was but the, the interaction between the, the percussion instruments was really quite uh, complex and it sounded really natural despite the fact. You can actually see it as well in the final battle against Rayquaza music, which also has some really interesting bass lines. Uh, and yeah, that's another thing. The bass in the Rescue Team and Explorer is, is, is just immaculate. I love the bass, especially in Red Rescue Team soundtrack. The, the tone of the bass is what I really enjoy. And on the topic of the tone of the Red Rescue Team bass, the Blue Rescue Team bass is a complete downgrade and I hate the entire Blue Rescue Team soundtrack because of that. When I try to listen uh, for references, when I arrange Rescue Team music, I always try to look for the Red Rescue Team version of the soundtrack because the bass is so much clearer and more pronounced than that and that's really what I think Arata Yoshi had in mind at the time. Some other things I might not have noticed explicitly on the first listen. Some uh, more complex harmonic structures, usages, I don't know how to phrase this very well. But for example, I I, I want to bring Mount Horn up because it's actually 
one of the few pieces in Mystery Dungeon that uses polytonality, which is two key signatures occurring at the same time. It's still quite interesting how Urata Yoshi managed to just slip this in without being so jarring. Because most of the time when you have these atypical harmonic things, it's it's very hard to work with and to make it sound acceptable to the general audience. Yeah, it's it's very interesting how Yoshi san manages to grab some things from a place that most people aren't willing to venture into and bring it to like a common audience, if that makes any sense. I think those are my three points. So yeah, thanks for the questions, Spark Chief. I uh, hope you will enjoy what content I will make in the future as well. Thank you. Here's a question from Star Aiden. Curious question, but is national service like the uh, boys to men films? <laughs> I I'm sorry, but <laughs> okay. The, the 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 title of the film is "Our Boys to Men" without the comma. As in "our boys" is a phrase meaning uh just just boy. In like a singlish context, so that that's why it's called that. It's not uh, ah boys to men. No, <laughs> no, that would be a funny title, wouldn't it? But okay, so the ah boys to men film. I honestly hadn't watched it in so long that I forgot how it went. But since it was developed and filmed in cooperation with the Singapore Army, there are a lot of accurate parts of the film but you know nowadays because firstly i was invested during covid and secondly it's it's been like almost uh i think almost half a decade since the film was released by the time i understood there were of course a lot a lot of changes that happened and since i i guess i can disclose this since i'm not in an infantry location most of the stuff in the later films don't really apply to me. So, yeah, I can't really be answerable to this question. But, okay, so what the film does get right is the personalities of the characters. There's definitely a lot of parallels I could draw between people I know and people in the film. In BMT, a few funny things did happen that some of which are a little more wild than what happened in the film. <laughs> Though, hmm, I don't think I think can fully disclose those things. I, I keep saying that, but it's just because I, I really don't remember anything <laughs> from back then. It's been more than a year since I've enlisted. All those BMT memories have kind of faded away, which is a bit sad, but the progression of time, is, it, it's scary. You know, actually, I'm really interested in how you knew what a voice to men even was because i i think singaporean cinema rarely gets out of the country and maybe there's a reason for that content it's quite specific the movie definitely made as excuse the word but propaganda you know so <laughs> yeah but hey, hey thanks for the question i i appreciate that you you want to know more about this stuff it's kind of amazing, actually. All right, moving on. We have a question from Lat. Hi, Lat. You are a administrator on Ninch Music, a really popular online arrangement site for video game music and the like. I don't know why I was introducing you like that. Anyway, what are some inspiration sources for writing? In other words, composers or arrangers you look up to or draw ideas from. I'm curious because I think you have a very distinct and creative style of writing arrangements. So honestly, my pool of inspiration is not very big. I generally think that the majority of my influence comes from 80s, maybe late, early 90s music because when I was a kid, my dad would turn the radio onto this channel that only really played 80s and 90s music, yeah, but that was basically what I was listening to at the time. You know, childhood influence, like yada yada yada, that sort of thing. So a lot of 80s influence really gets to my music, and I think most of y'all can actually see that. I, I got in a few comments that, oh, you really admit the 80s style in this one. 
But in terms of composers and arrangers, I can't discount Keisan and Tsubeyama. It was really my introduction to that really generic Japanese pop chord progression. I, I, I realized that I can't stop using the progression after I listen to、uh, Keisan and Tsubeyama. I, I actually have a problem. You can tell that there was a point in time where my original music it, it, it changed it changed a bit.、Uh, arrangers, mostly in the VGM sphere. Insane in the Raid. I really like in the past he sang the songs arrangements of Undertale. Those were actually what got me into doing the piano duet arrangement project. Then I have other influences like from the fusion side. I really love T Square, Cassiopeia. Those are two really good bands. My God, I love their music. Other than that, I guess you can't discount the major composers and arrangers that wrote most of the pieces I played in concert band. People like maybe James Swearingen, Swearingen, I think I don't actually know how to pronounce that last name. I'm sorry. Maybe even Percy Granger. I I really love Children's March. It was the only actual piece I played of his back in my concert band days. Actually, no, I also played Country Gardens, which is also a really good piece of music. There are also a few Japanese composers who write music for a concert band that I really enjoy. Actually, I already have another playlist on my channel called "Pieces I Played," and that is actually just a whole playlist of music that I could find on YouTube of pieces that I played in the past. So that's a very big library of inspiration from my teenage years.、And、I can actually say that now because I'm approaching 20 years old at this rate. And part two of this question: What makes you happy, and are you getting enough of it in your life? Wow, that's a question. It's it's very deep this question, and honestly, what makes me happy? I think that I'm happy when I satisfy people around me. That's a weird way to put it, but I like it when I can do my own thing, and others can do their own things, and we're both just not inconvenienced at all. Like. I I don't like to trouble others. For example, like in the army, when I'm told to do something that I could probably just do myself, I won't ask other people to help me do it. I think I feel the most happy when I'm left to my own、uh, desires. If that's a way of phrasing that, I honestly don't like being bothered. It's a personality thing. It. This is a really hard question to answer. I'm sorry, <laughs> but. Am I getting enough of what makes me happy right now? In all honesty, I like to say no, but it's expected because I'm in the army right now, and it's it's not supposed to be an enjoyable experience. Though, you know, before the army, when I was doing school, I really was actually quite satisfied with my life. After the army, I had really got most of the stuff sorted out yet. It's definitely gonna be a bit more stress than I'd like it to be, despite what I want right now. But at this part of my life, where there's a lot of transitions happening, it's expected. Of course, I I love to to be more happy, whatever that means, whatever takes me there. I'm not even sure at this rate, though. You know, life isn't all sunshine and rainbows, and. I can't expect myself to always get enough of what makes me happy. Thanks, Slat, for these insightful questions. Okay, final question. This is from Ekichi no Mi. I love the atmosphere of the BGM of this video has. I like to listen to this music itself as a video. Okay, so about the music in the background of the announcement video, it's. Supposed to be, if you can tell, an imitation of Subiana, but I I really do not have the software that the original had, so the instruments are completely different. Even though maybe the structure is the same, also I do not know how to use Udao, so I just <laughs> I I felt like I was incapable of making the full version of that for quite a long time. But yeah, I already released the instrumental on my SoundCloud, so I'll leave a link to that in the description. So we've come to the end of the Q and A. Holy, 
<laughs> it's been eight months since I asked for questions from y'all. And once again, I'm extremely sorry for how long this has taken me to make. I didn't think that this would be a very big undertaking at first, but I kept making it harder for myself. Like I drew these drawings of myself like, wow, that, that was a bad decision. Holy hell, I spent most of the time actually just editing this little pictures of me jumping around. But hey, that's, that's on me. Thanks guys for all the, the questions you've asked. I appreciate the support once again. It's been a wild ride to hear 2.4k subscribers at the moment. So hey, in future subscriber milestones, maybe I'll do more Q&As, who knows? Yeah. Okay, that's the video. Bye.